eight after B. Yes, I want to be sure that the strings are very, very soft here. Let's try it at B, Boston. Bassoon also. Ba, ba. Diminish it. Huh? Diminish those quarters. Diminish the quarters, please. <coughs> and short. Da, 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 da. And be sure that you stop the tone because they're spiccato. Not da, 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 da. Huh? Once more, Boston. And also, when you have an accent, ba, ba, it doesn't stay forked. Boston. <laughs> after two years of age. Uh -huh. And then I was brought to California. And my musical life, well, my musical life, I suppose it began <laughs> when I was 10 years old for the simple reason that I used to bite my nails. <laughs> <laughs> and the doctor said to my stepmother, I think if you let her play the piano, she'll stop biting her nails. And on such slim beginnings, I became a musician. I was crazy about the piano right from the start. And my first teacher was a girl across the street who was 12 years of age. The first thing I remember anybody saying about me was that, oh, she can play in the dark. She can play in the dark without a light. And uh, I always thought I was extremely clever to put my foot down on the pedal and just manufacture all these great big runs and, and play lots of mistakes, but I got the general gist of it. And I felt that it was great. But of course, it was with lots of pep and lots of temperament, lots of expression, and just terrible as far as technique was concerned. But I was very, very small at my age, and so I was considered wonderful. And then uh, my stepmother was one who went around to different uh, seances and religions and so forth. And so, since I was a, the only child, well, a foster child, I had to go too. And so then we went to these uh, spiritualistic meetings and they had messages from yonder, you know. And uh, the advantage to me was that the mediums would go into trance and then say that Liszt was standing in back of me. Oh, and then at another time, they'd say Beethoven was standing in back of me. And uh, that's where my great passion for Beethoven started, I think. And of course, I enjoyed this tremendously because uh, they told me I was going to be a great musician. 
and that Liszt had said I would be a great musician. meetings because then women would come and hold me in their arms and that's the only way I got any affection and and uh, then I would sort of dream about having an automobile accident in front of somebody's house just so they'd pick me up and be affectionate those were the, the beginnings and then of course the music is one reason why it's everything in my life because the music was uh, the thing that saved my reason my sanity and and I used to cry and stroke the piano and say, that at least doesn't hurt little children. And then I swore that when I grew up, I was going to be nice to little children because I, I didn't have a very happy childhood. Oh, yes, then a very important part in my conducting preparation was that we used to go to band concerts Sunday afternoon, Lakeside Park. And <clears throat> Professor Paul Steindorf, you're sitting right by his picture. No, here, there. Uh, he was the conductor of the band concerts. And again, I thought, what a wand, magic wand could do, a stick, a little stick. And I got a tremendous crush on him. But when I talked to him about wanting to be a conductor, he said, Oh, that's not possible. He'll never, never have an opportunity. That's not possible. There's a bunch of the orchestras got come on.
in Germany, and I cried my eyes out because I didn't want to leave it. And these Prussians, you know, they could not... Everybody's always tickled to death to get out of school, and I always cried when I had to leave school. This happened in California or whether it was in Germany. And then I had a, my American debut, I mean, my Berlin, Berlin debut right. of the big orchestra, the New York... The, the, I'm stupid. <laughs> the Berlin Philharmonic on January the 10th, 1930. I conducted the Berlin Philharmonic. What was the program? The program was the Dvorak Symphony in D minor, which I'm about to conduct here in mm -hmm. Denver soon. And the soloist was a singer, supposed to be a singer, singing a big aria of Beethoven. But she did something very strange. I don't know if you want to hear about that. But was she, it how strange was it? Well, it was strange in this way. She was crazy to be a great singer, but she uh, studied and lived in, 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 in Italy, and she had a lover in Italy. Mm -hmm. And this took place in January. Yeah. And without telling me, she sneaked off to Milano to have to continue her love life with her gentleman friend in Milano. And they, uh, <clears throat> shall we say, were so energetic about it that she came back and lost her voice. That happens not to be very good for the voice. In case you don't know that. <laughs> Especially when you're singing a Beethoven aria. And I was so mad at her, and I so mad at her, and she said, you don't know anything about love. She says, all you care about is your music. And, and, and I said, well, I, I, I only know this, that when I have a commitment, I try to fulfill it. And so three days before, my world debut of a great big concert and orchestra with all the critics coming from all over Berlin for Germany to damn because they were so suspicious that I couldn't do anything and and from New York and everywhere I had to have a different soloist three days before the concert and so I had a pianist who was in our school and she played the Schumann concerto which which uh, this girl played last night and and so then the point was, instead of damning, the critics gave such high praise, such tremendous praise, and AP, uh, United States AP, sent it around the United States, and, and in those days they had Rotograveur in New York, and it came in the New York Times, Rotograveur, a picture of my conducting the orchestra. Wow. <laughs> in the basement of some funny little, I, I paid, I think, $10 a week. And uh, one, one day the phone rang. Antonia, this is Mrs. Prince. Yes, Mrs. Prince. Antonia, I want to ask you something. I could get a concert for you at the Metropolitan Opera House, but it's going to cost me $1,000 because Mrs. Downs says she's not about to have someone conduct who's not known in New York. And she said it would cost her $1,000 to put on somebody not known. She said, I'm willing to pay 500. Do you think you have enough friends who could raise the other 500? I said, why, of course. <laughs> Privately, I had no idea <laughs> where. <see. laughs> and of course, she could have paid the whole thing like that. But she wanted to see what I was made of, see? I said, of course, Mrs. Prince. And I went crazy with excitement, you see? And so I called up my friend, Mrs. John J. White in Greenwich, Connecticut. Her husband's a stockbroker. And she was a very good friend of mine. And I said, Mrs. White, Mrs. White, I can conduct in New York. Help me, help me. We have to fill the second tier boxes. That's $500 worth. And I told her all the story, and she said, Oh, Antonia, I don't know what to do. I said, help me, help me. So she got a committee of her best friends together, and you know how they do in those, those society 
ropes. She'd call up people. She said, now, I want a box party. Antonia Brico is going to have a boot. The Metropolitan. And wouldn't it be fun to have a supper party and then engage a box at the Metropolitan? And the whole second tier box she got sold to her friends. And every week that she gets some money, I'd go to see Mrs. Prince with a twinkle in her eye and I'd say, here's some money toward my how are you doing on your half? <laughs> are you selling the tickets? Are you able to sell it? Oh, I'm bad at times. She never sold it. She gave them away. <laughs> And as I dropped the dollars into her lap, she just was so amused, you know, and I got the whole 500. And I said, did you ever get your 500 together? And she says, yes, I managed. <laughs> and then she said, now you have to have a dress made for this concert. So she had to tailor it, and I had to have fittings and everything. She got so steamed up about this. I was her protege for the year. And all of her friends knew Mrs. Sid Sidney Prince had, some, had a protege. And Mrs. Down said, nobody will be interested in staff having a woman conductor. And the minute she announced it, all the press came to my door. It made the front page of the papers. And the woman to conduct in the Metropolitan. And she just nearly died over the surprise of all the press and radio and everything that happened. The night of the concert, I always remember she had her white mink. And she had me in her car with her, of course. And she, she was much more nervous than I was. I was having a lovely time. I was going to conduct. <laughs> and so there we were. And this was the most screaming ovation and success that Mrs. Dow said, you may have a second concert without any money paying in advance. And so we had the second concert. And then Mrs. Dow said, you may have a third concert. And I don't know if you're so disgustingly young that you don't remember the name of John Charles Thomas. He was a famous baritone. And he happened to be the solos for the third concert that Mrs. Downs huh. wanted me to conduct. And he said, no, I am not going to sing under a woman conductor. And Mrs. Downs said, why? With all this fabulous press, he said, that's the point. Then the pe that will take all the attention away from me. Okay. So he denied me that third concert at the Metropolitan.
how would it feel to you if you had, in the whole year, four performances? Would you like that? All right. I have four, I have five performances a year. I'm strong enough to have five performances a month. I'm essentially a creative artist, and I teach most of the time, and I would like to conduct more than five performances. I'm squeezed. I'm frustrated because right. I conduct four, five concerts a year, sometimes six, and I'd like to conduct five concerts a month. I cannot play my instrument, which is the orchestra. I get an opportunity like last Sunday. I was extraordinarily happy, and that's one. That's like giving a starving person a piece of bread after days of hunger. Does that answer your question? I want to conduct professional orchestras. And I want to conduct in New York. I want to conduct in California. All over the in country. In San Francisco. I want to conduct in Russia. Yes. He owes the name Evgeny Svetlana. I die inside because she is a woman in Russia conducting all the time. Evgeny Svetlana, I know enough Russian, and you do too, that that's a woman's name right. and it's a woman conducting everything. It isn't now. And is it that whole time? That the whole wanted? time. Yes, the whole time. Of course, you're just, I'm just talking to you now about it. I don't talk about it every day. I don't let everybody know my heart break. The people closest to me don't understand. It's a perpetual heartbreak. The Denver Symphony, you know what they said about the, in the Denver Symphony once? Do you know that there's a cup club here called the Cactus Club? It's a male club, one of the very, very fashionable male clubs. And the people said, how can we have a woman conductor who could can invite her to the cactus club? That's it. And I hate to tell you, but the people who prevented me the most from conducting have been women. <laughs> Again, a woman. Again, a woman. There was pressure to bear from certain sides, though, so that I conducted in Genoa. Mm -hmm. And she said, I tell you that the, that they're going to, the audience is going to throw rotten tomatoes and rotten eggs at you. And I said, no, they won't. And so when the concert came, they, they were just, they were in the trees. It was so packed and jammed. And the concert master, it was an all-male orchestra, and the concert master said in first-class Italian, because I speak Italian, he said, after the, at the intermission of the rehearsal, he said, Io domando perdono per i miei pensieri. I beg your pardon for my thoughts before the rehearsal. <laughs> 